Welcome to Yin Yoga Lifestyle. I am your host, Colette Darville, cultivating our body's resilience and inner silence and its application to all aspects of your life. Let's become enlightened and enjoy the power of intuitiveness and creativity. Listening to Society Bites Radio, social interaction for the mind and soul. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I am your host, Colette Darville, and this is Yin Yoga Lifestyle. So, now let us take a deep meditative breath. Inhale, so. Exhale, hum. Rachel Webb at Internet Dakini is an instructor in yoga and meditation teacher training and is also the executive director at Three Jewel Studio in New York City. This nonprofit organization's mission is to offer spiritual education through free to the community yoga classes, a comprehensive meditation program with a colorful Tibetan backbone, and studies in Tibetan Buddhism teaching all from a team of dedicated seasoned practitioners at Three Jewels in New York City. Rachel Webb has trained simultaneously in yoga and mental health for the past decade and in Tibetan Buddhism for the past six years. She has completed a meditation teacher training and private yoga teacher training in 2017 and is a certified Buddhist philosophy practitioner. She has over six years of experience working with people diagnosed with serious mental illness, assisting them in achieving wellness goals. Rachel has hosted several therapeutic groups on relationship health over the past year and is currently working on relationship wellness workbooks that combine modern psychological approaches with Buddhist techniques. Welcome to Yin Yoga Lifestyle, Rachel. Thank you so much, Colette. It's it's nice to hear my bio read to me in your voice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so funny that um, you know when I I was I was reading um, your bio and I thought, uh, gosh, for somebody so young, you've done so much and um, and truly truly an enlightened being. And I'm so happy to have you on the show today. Um, but my first question is, it's really burning in my brain, <laughs> is how did you discover yoga and, of course, your meditation practice? Oh, thank, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, my discovery story is actually quite funny. Um, so I was living in New York City, as I still am, and I had just gone through a really tough breakup, and I lost my job. Um, and I was sort of living in this apartment in New York, uh, you know, with no furniture because I had no money. And I, I just I, I had gone through this period of my life where I was trying to do everything right. I became vegan. I was actually doing yoga already at this time. Mm-hmm. Um, I was doing it on St. Mark's. If you know yoga to the people, um, yeah. they had you know, free yoga classes to the community. So I was already doing asana. Um, I was going to therapy and I was doing all this stuff that you think you're supposed to do to (laughs) be happy, (laughs) right? And, um, but I wasn't, it wasn't working for me. And I had a lot of free time because I had lost my job. And so I was reading a lot. And watching documentaries on spirituality, I just, I was really seeking answers. Mm -hmm. And I read this book, which you probably know, called Be Here Now um, by Ram Ram Dass, who Mm -hmm. who actually passed this year. And in the book, in the book, he said, you know, this is, this is what it's like, guys. He, He said some truths that really resonated with me, which I, which I'll go into. But he said at the end of the book, you need to find a teacher, You need to find a spiritual teacher who, like, understands you. And so I started Googling. This is the funny part. I started Googling, how do you find a guru? 
And if you've ever Googled <laughs> how to find a guru, you get some really strange search results. Um, but I, it, I ended up finding someone, not on the internet, but down the block from my house. Um, I met um, Hector Marcel, who's my spiritual teacher, uh, who's the president of Three Jewels. I met him and his partner, Stephen, at this cafe in Bushwick, which is, you know, no longer open. Um, and, and they were just standing online to get a cup of coffee and the line was really long and, uh, oh they were like, Oh, come, you can, you can cut in front of us. Like the line's really long. I didn't know them. They were just these two random guys that were talking to me. And I was like, Oh no, I can't do that. You know, I'm a yogi. I need to be nice to people. So I went to the back of the line. I was like, I can't cut all these people in line. And uh, anyway, so we ended up getting our coffee and and I sat down with them and they said, you know, who are you? What are you about? And I said, well, I studied psychology at NYU, but what I'm really about is this. And I pulled, you know, this spiritual text out of my bag, the Tibetan book of living and dying. I said, I've been reading this book and they both had this strange look come over their faces and they were like, well, we, we run a Buddhist center. It's called three jewels. Wow. And you should, you should come sometime. And I said, okay. <laughs> I, went, I think I went the next week and I, I just um, sat in on the free philosophy classes, which we still hold to this day. And uh, what I heard in those classes changed my life and, and empowered me to change my life. And um, that's when I started meditating. I didn't like meditation before then, but it was really after I heard the Buddhist teachings, you know, mm-hmm. that said, um, Life is suffering, but there's a way out. And the way out, you have to meditate. And I said, okay, fine. I'll do this thing that I don't really like. <laughs> if you're telling me I have to do it, I'll do it. Um, and, and that's how I started my meditation practice, honestly. It was out of necessity um, well, for it the was struggles at, I was going through. And the universe, you know, I'm a full believer, you know, when you're ready, of course, the teacher appears. But at the same time, there are no coincidences. You know, um, you're where you should be at the time you are. And goodness, what a what a brilliant story. Um, you are open <laughs> to it. You're absolutely open to it. Um, yeah. And and you follow the teachings of Tibetan Buddhism, don't you? Um, mm-hmm. So you, for the for our listeners who are not aware of what mm-hmm. the, the Tibetan Buddhism uh, teachings are, could you explain what this is? Absolutely. I mean. There's so much to it, but mm-hmm. when I when I have to be brief, what what I generally do is I talk about you know the essence of the Buddhist teachings. I don't like calling myself a Buddhist. Also, I mean it's yeah. fine that you I, sometimes I do out of necessity, but basically um, it's just the belief that the realm that we're in, the experience that we're all in right now, and I think it's really easy that we could all agree with this. It's a it's a suffering existence. Like, Mm -hmm. and it's easy to see Mm COVID-19, right? We've had Mm -hmm. a lot of cultural unrest in this country. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of um, political unrest in this country. Mm -hmm. People are facing health problems, spiritual problems, financial problems everywhere. It's easy to see. So the Buddha says, listen, we live in this place. It's called samsara. Samsara is just the word for pervasive suffering. Okay. But he says we could be happy. We could be happy. We're living in suffering right now, and it's usually like low-level, medium-level, high-level suffering, but but we actually don't have to be. And he teaches this in something called the four Arya truths. So the first truth, life is suffering, aging, sickness, death. It's something we don't like to talk about, I think, especially in America. Um, we don't like to talk about illness. We don't like to talk about death. But he says, listen, it's true. If you look at your life, you don't know when you're going to die. And everyone's like, oh, my God. But then you right. can also say, you know, look at look at your job, look at your health, look at your relationships. It's not easy. Let's yeah. just admit to it. So step one, admit to it. Life isn't easy. Step two, he says, this is caused. There, there's a reason why it's not easy. He says, step two, second truth, suffering is caused. Mm. And this is something that's kind of interesting because I don't think – that I ever sat down and said, like almost as though I was a mathematician or a scientist, where did this pain 
come from? Where did the depression come from? Or where did the anxiety come from? Where did the romantic problems come from? And Buddha just says, listen, cause and effect is true. We believe it in physics. But for some reason, we don't really think about it in regards to our psychological state or anything like that. So he's just saying there's a cause and the cause comes from our own mind. Right. You know, and and how do I know that? I know that because I could go to the same movie as someone else and I can walk out and say that was an amazing movie. They walk out and say that was a horrible movie. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Right. And so it doesn't come from the movie. It comes from my mind. So that's the second truth. The third is that if my suffering is caused, then there's an end to it. Mm. If it was created, then it can be ended. It can be changed. I can change my experience of my normal life into a beautiful life. And then the fourth truth, the fourth of the four Arya truths, um, often translated the four noble truths, by the way. Right. Yes, exactly. But, But but the root word is Arya, which means someone who's woken up to the nature of reality, someone who's seen the truth. The fourth one is just that there's a path out. There's actually a path. There's a bunch of steps that you can follow in your mind to move from an experience that's a suffering experience into a blissful, towards a happy experience, mm-hmm. towards a blissful experience that actually doesn't end. And, and so that's the, that's the core of it. It's saying, listen, we're suffering, but we don't have to. Yeah. That's what a Buddhist believes. And it's, um, <clears throat> but we, but many of us feel that, you know, we're suffering and we're suffering all day long. But, uh, you know, I think to find the relief um, mm. is something that it, it takes, a, it takes some work, but I, I think it's the understanding people don't understand. And you've said that so beautifully just now. And so simply um, now, you know, I do want to ask you what the aspects of the philosophies, philosophies of Buddhism do you believe are the most beneficial to well-being? Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's locked into those truths. And, right. and I can elaborate on it. So when I use the movie example, it's such a trivial example, right? Mm-hmm. Like, who cares if I like the movie and you didn't like the movie? Um, unless it actually does something about the larger experience of my life. Right. So there's, there's two things. There's two ways of looking at reality, according to Buddhism. There's what appears to be true and what's actually true. Right. So what appears to be true, that's called karma. And, and I don't always like using that word because it's a, it's a foreign word to people. Um, karma just means my mental seeds. It means mm-hmm. how my mind moves, right? The potential yeah. in my mind um, and the results of those potentials, what appears to be true. And then what's, what's really true. And which, that is, that's what a lot of people sometimes have, um, you know, they perceive something that it's true or they think something that's true or they imagine mm-hmm. something that's true, but it's actually has it's actually not, right? Absolutely. And and that is the play between illusion and reality. Right. And if, if we if we are perceiving the illusion, we're believing the illusion, then we suffer. But yeah. the Buddha says that if we if we if we're actually experiencing reality as it is, that this is a blissful experience. So we just have to bring our mind to relate with what's really going on. And there's a really simple example, because to me, if I just go around saying illusion, reality, karma, emptiness, you know, whatever, it doesn't sink into my heart in a concrete way. It doesn't sink into my mind in a concrete way. And there's this example, um, there's this example that dates back, you know, hundreds of years with a reed, but Mm -hmm. but we'll say a pen. Mm-hmm. We'll, say, we'll use a pen as an example. So if I'm, if I'm, and, and I'm sure you, you, maybe you have one on your desk right now and, and you can sort of look at it um, and, and the listeners can think of a pen. Maybe they can hold a pen that's close to them. So, you know, what is this thing, right? It's a pen. Cool. We agree as humans, this is a pen. But right. what if a dog walked into the room? You know, I put my dog away so that she wouldn't bother me during this recording. During this <gasps> How podcast. did you know that? <laughs> See? <laughs> you did that. You, did I you actually that did that. I did that. <laughs> oh so I did too. So Gaia's, 
you know, in the bedroom right now. Right. And so um, Gaia is her name. Anyway, if she walks into the room and I have this thing in my hand, this object, which I call a pen, and I start waving it around. 